I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and this is Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. We have a great show for you today. We are at CES, and as you can see in the background, we have something that is very innovative and very cool, and something we're going to be using a lot of in the future. Uh, and here to talk to us about it is Jeff Welser, Vice President and Labs Director for IBM Research. The topic of today's show is quantum computing. And this is not just a hypothetical conversation, we actually have a prototype of a quantum computer in the background right here. This is a prototype of the world's first 50 qubit machine. Uh, Jeff, you helped design it. Uh, I think we've got, a, we've got a lot to cover on this conversation about what is quantum computing, how it works, but I think first we should just talk about the elephant in the room, which is the quantum <laughs> computer in the room. Yeah, so no, thanks very much. This is, a, yeah, we're really proud of this system. As you can see, it probably looks like no other computer you've ever seen before. And I'll say right from the beginning, all this stuff above that bottom silver canister is all for support of the chip which sits there. So the computer itself is a, is a, a silicon chip down in that silicon ca in that aluminum canister. The purpose of this is to isolate it entirely from all sources of noise. So the most pernicious source of noise is actually just the room temperature itself. So one of the things this is doing is keeping it very cool. So if this were actually running, you'd have a white shell around this whole thing and we'd pump it down to a low vacuum. And all those layers would be helping to keep that system cool. So at the very top, it would be a very balmy four Kelvin, which is a, a liquid helium temperature. Each of these plates has a different a mixture of, uh, of helium isotopes and using uh, dilution refrigeration to actually make them colder and colder. So the one right below it is about 800 millikelvin. You get down to a couple hundred millikelvin. By the time you get down to the final plate and then down into where the chip is, we're at 10 millikelvin, which is literally 10 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. So let's say pretty cold. So that's a lot of effort to put into cooling a chip. Yeah. Uh, PC mag fans have been cooling their CPUs for a long time using <laughs> water, using fans. Uh, but this is an order of magnitude difference. And it's really because the technology is very, very different. Um, can you just explain as briefly as you can, or as, as, a, as clear, clearly as you can, what is quantum computing? What makes it so different? Yeah, so if we think about classical computers, all the computers we use today, they all rely on bits, and we're all familiar with a bit. And a bit is either a one or a zero in a binary system. Um, in quantum computers, the basic unit you use is something called a qubit. Um, and it also can be a one or a zero, but because it's a quantum system, it's a quantum state, it can actually be a combination of one and zero at the same time. We say it's in a superposition of one and zero. So it's a little bit one and a little bit zero at the same time. Um, not only that, but you can take two of those qubits and entangle them so that the state of one of them depends on the state of the other. So if this is a little bit more one, this might be a little bit more zero or vice versa. So this, these quantum effects we're doing um, allow us to do calculations very differently than we do with classical systems. But to your point, they're very fragile, as you might imagine. Uh, in the end, when you go to measure the system, it always has to give you a one or a zero. So anything, any thermal noise, electrical noise, magnetic noise, will knock these things out of that superposition uh, and then cause an error potentially. So that's part of why you're creating a perfectly quiet, perfectly still, perfectly shielded environment with which to, to sort of set these uh, qubits Correctly. Um, working. Yep. And then, uh, and obviously that can be destabilized very quickly. Just how quickly, how long does, do those states last? Right, so right now on average we keep our qubits uh, in their states for 50 to 100 microseconds. We say it's a 50 to 100 microsecond coherence time, um, which sounds very short, but actually is quite long by quantum computing standards. So it's one of the things that makes this system possible. Now we'd like to increase that by a couple orders of magnitude over time, but already at the 50 to 100 microseconds you have enough time to do some interesting calculations. So your previous systems were 20 qubits. Um, that's what the system that can be accessed online. Um, what can you do with 50 qubits? Like how much processing power is that? Right, so it's, it's always hard to compare a classical and a quantum system um, because the first thing that should be noted is quantum systems are good for doing very specific types of algorithms. Um, factorization and cryptography is one that people have talked about a lot. Uh, the reality is that would require millions of qubits to really do. Uh, but at 50 to 100 qubits, you can start to do things where you really are taking advantage of the quantum nature to simulate things that are themselves quantum. So, for example, quantum chemistry. Um, in fact, in September, with using only 17 qubits, we published a paper in Nature simulating some very simple molecules of a few atoms. Um, now, those you could do on a classical system today. 
but it turns out by the time you get to 50 to 100 qubits, you can actually simulate some molecules that you couldn't actually do on a classical system, at least not in a, a reasonable amount of time. And it gets down to the fact that you are simulating the quantum effects with quantum effects. It's, um, it's really interesting because most people think about processing power as just scaling indefinitely, getting faster and faster. But there, there is a subset of problems that our current binary processors just are, will probably never be able to solve. Right. And that's, those are the problems that the hope is that quantum computing will be able to address. That's exactly right. And, and if you think about it, if you think about a standard system with bits, if you have 10 bits and you say you've got then those n states, those 10 qubits would actually be 2 to the n, so 2 raised to the power of n, which would be 1,024 states. So you can already see, even at that small number, how many extra states you can explore at the same time. So it really, you can think of it as being sort of massively parallel for problems that can be mapped onto that particular kind of parallelism. So uh, people hear about this and they think, oh, well, those are those researchers, they're making these computers to do these really esoteric uh, calculations but you've actually made quantum computing available to the masses online. Uh, as long as you have an internet connection, you can actually run experiments on a quantum computer. Absolutely, so uh, we, uh, we released our first version in May of 2016, and it was only five qubits. Uh, we upgraded that to be 16 qubits, and that's available today on the cloud. Um, it's at ibm.com slash ibmq. Uh, and anyone can go on and use it. There's some great tutorial videos. It's got a nice graphical interface, so you can literally design your, your quantum gates and how you want to uh, maneuver or um, uh, uh, manipulate your qubits. Uh, you can run that on a simulator, uh, or you can actually run it on a real system just like this, uh, sitting in our Yorktown Heights lab, uh, down to 10 millikelvin there. Uh, we've run over um, 1.7 million simulations at this point. We have about 60,000 users who have accessed this system. Um, and we're finding it really exciting because it's interesting to see what people go to do with it, right? We've had many universities go after it. We've had over 35 scientific papers published by other universities who use the system to go prove out theories that up till now you couldn't actually prove. And by actually running it, you had to just do it in theory. Yeah. So it's um, it's really exciting to see that happen. The um, is it particularly difficult to program for this type of interface? Because I think most programmers are very used to sort of the binary nature of things. I think you have to program. You have to ask the questions differently. That's a, that's actually the key part. And I think one of the things that we uh, you'll find on the IBM Q site is a, a nice sets of, sets of notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, and things that show you examples of different types of calculations you can do and give you a feel for what you're trying to do. Uh, the interface is fairly simple. The number of gates you have to use are actually fairly small, um, but it really is more like. Think about it almost like more like programming a circuit and pulling together gates to, to make a series uh, of, of calculations rather than writing Java code or something. The, uh, in terms of the, uh, what, what the, the device is actually used for, are there any applications that you're really excited about that it's being used for now or that it will be used for in the near future? Well, I think that the nearest term application clearly is going to be in things like quantum, mater quantum materials, quantum chemistry kinds of simulation. And, and we see some of the partners uh, that we've started with uh, being most interested there. So um, in addition to what we offered uh, publicly on the web to everyone, we started a network, a commercial network in December with 12 partners who have access to the 20 qubit system you, uh, you alluded to, and then we'll have access to 50 qubit when it's released. Um, and they're looking at a whole range of things. So we've got uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, for example, looking at how you might be able to apply this in some of the massive problems they have in finance uh, and thinking about how you could use um, the parallelization there. We have groups like Samsung or JSR looking at how you could use some of the materials capabilities uh, for predicting new materials. Um, you know, finding new materials is a very manual process today. You do a lot of work in the lab to just test different combinations. If you could simulate uh, very complex materials in a quantum system first, you could achieve real breakthroughs in that. The, um, in terms of uh, the, the one of the th you, you talked a little bit about cryptography, um, that was one of the one of the hypotheses is that once we have a quantum computer, we'll be able to do this factoring, which will be able to solve a lot of cryptological problems. Mm -hmm. um, you seem almost a little dismissive of that, like it's that's going to be a, a ways down the road. It is uh, in that um, in order to be able to solve a problem that um, you can't just do on a classical system, you would have to have a quantum system that was quite large, so millions of qubits, and those qubits would have to be uh, much longer coherence times than we have here, much lower error rates than we get now, uh, before it become actually interesting. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of concern that when we reach that point, perhaps we'll actually break the encryption uh, that's on the internet today. And while it's true you could in theory break that encryption, you can also produce other encryption that would actually not be breakable. So I think the concerns are not really uh, valid at this point. And in any case, it's a long way before we'll even be close to being able to do that. All right. So the technology could provide its own solution Correct. as well. Yeah. Um, both sides would be able to use that. Um, in terms of processing power, obviously this is moving very quickly. 
how, when do you think that, um, and again, it's hard to compare, um, but th th when do you think that quantum computing will be able to rival just classical computing power? Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion of a so-called uh, quantum. Or is it even a relevant question? It, it is, actually. I, there's been a lot of discussion about quantum superiority, which I think is something we tend to shy away from because what's superior, what isn't superior, you know, it really can be in the eye of the beholder. But we do talk about quantum advantage. At what, at what point can you do an algorithm on the system that actually does it better or faster than what you can do on the classical system? Uh, taking into account all the overhead of doing programming and getting it all loaded up there correctly. Um, and I think, you know, for quantum chemistry, once you reach about the 100 qubit level, you can start to see quantum advantage. We believe you'll start to see quantum advantage. Uh, where you can actually start to simulate some things on the quantum system system much more efficiently uh, than you can on a, on a classical system. And not too long after that, in, in the hundreds of qubits, you're probably able to simulate some things in quantum chemistry on the system you couldn't simulate on any classical system in any reasonable amount of time. So we are fairly close to that point, which I think is one of the reasons that quantum qubits has become exciting uh, again, because it's not like you have to get to millions of qubits, you can do it uh, in the near term. The, uh, we were talking earlier before we started filming about what makes IBM research different and part of what allows you to do this is that you've got sort of a full stack research facility where you've got developers working with atoms and you've got developers working with AI or engineers working with AI. Mm -hmm. um, is there anybody else in the market that's really doing what you guys are doing? Uh, I don't think I know of any industrial research lab that really has the full gambit we have today. And we, we still have people who work on polymers and materials for continuing our, our power systems, our, our, let's say, standard classical systems, which will continue on and be used in conjunction with these. Now those same people are looking at how can I use those materials to go after quantum systems, where now I need systems that run at 10 millikelvin, different materials, I need to keep noise down, different challenges, or neuromorphic systems that are maybe doing things more like the brain does them for deep learning kinds of algorithms. So having that kind of materials and system capability up through chips, systems, and then the algorithm and theory on top of it is really an advantage. Um, actually, we announced uh, we're about to announce that we uh, had our 25th year in a row of, of patent leadership. We passed the 9,000 patents this year. First time a company has ever done that. And that is because of the drive that we have on the research level to continually look for all these different avenues. So obviously a lot of those in the quantum space, many more than of course are in the AI space, cybersecurity and cloud space right now. Uh, but I think having that kind of research capability that drives a really broad portfolio really leads to uh, advantage at something uh, this complicated. So I want to ask you some of the questions I ask all my guests. Um, is there any particular technology trend that concerns you, something that keeps you up at night? I think, I think the thing that concerns me always is, um, are we continuing to stay on top of our, our need for cybersecurity? Are we keeping our systems secure? It's an area that we focus on a lot at IBM, obviously, but across the industry we focus on this. And you know, as always, it's an arms race, and we want to make sure that we continue to, to use every, every tool at our disposal, you know, whether it's AI or quantum systems in the future, to keep things secure. So I think that's one where I think we have to keep our eyes open always. And I think the vulnerability is what's changed a lot. So you can have one breach at Equifax, and it can affect 100 million individuals. Uh, that's just a scale that didn't happen. Yeah. One the of the downsides of scaling, but, yeah. uh, but it, unfortunately, you know, it, it is something we just have to keep on top of. Uh, is there a technology or a gadget or device or service that you use every day that inspires wonder in you? Yeah. Well, maybe not one I use every day, but I will say what we're doing in neuromorphic systems right now, I find pretty amazing. You know, uh, if you think about running deep learning algorithms, you know, most of these get run in big data centers, and you know, they, they consume a ton of power to go and do these algorithms. You know, we designed a chip a few years ago that can do that same kind of image recognition um, on a single chip for less than 100 milliwatts. Well, now you're starting to talk about systems you could actually embed in mobile devices someday, right? And actually be able to do things at the edge that we thought we could only do in the cloud. I think that opens up a whole new area of, of possibilities, whether it's you know for mobile devices, robotics, um, autonomous vehicles. So I think that's really exciting to me. Very cool. If people want to follow what you're doing, follow your research, how can they find you online? So research.ibm.com uh, for our overall research portfolio. If you're interested in the quantum systems, then ibm.com slash ibmq. And I would encourage people to watch the videos of the demos of the, of the actual quantum computer in operation and, the, and listen to the audio. Because the <laughs> audio is, I think, just as compelling as the visuals. Yeah. It is a noisy system. It's an, on the outside. It is a noisy system. It absolutely is. The noise of those pumps. If this were running here, you would not be able to have this conversation. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary video. It's definitely worth checking out. Jeff, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Great. Thank you. That's Fast Forward for today. I wanna, if you want to see back episodes of the show, you can find them on PCMag.com. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you in the future.